Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, poetry lovers. Welcome to this program, conceived in advance, van tevoren bedacht. Um, I'll, I'll do my introduction in English. Uh, misschien even in het Nederlands nog even voor iedereen die dat nog even prettig vindt als binnenkom taal. Um, want het programma bestaat voor een belangrijk deel uit een gesprek met internationale dichters. En uh, het is toch het handigst om dat in het Engels te doen. Omdat ze, ook al zijn ze hier soms al meerdere dagen... Het is lastig gebleken om dan het Nederlands zoveel machtig te zijn dat we in die taal een gesprek zouden kunnen voeren. Um, so, I'll introduce a bit of this program. It's, uh, I can say, it's, it's some sort of an experiment. We do a, a talk with, with poets. We have a special um, performance of uh, a text by one of the poets they, uh, who is a guest at this uh, evening program but you'll find out how that works and how it goes. Okay, welcome to this program. We're going to talk with three poets who create their poetry in a targeted and well-considered way, according to methodical or thematic principles. Poetry that some people might call conceptual, even though this certainly doesn't apply to all three, but at least poetry that wants something else, something more than expressing innermost feelings or to dwell on everyday phenomena and eliciting them in an eloquent way. All three poets of tonight focus their attention on larger social developments, not to describe or to commend them, although they do that nowadays, but to expose the mechanisms and the circumstances behind those phenomena, sometimes by adapting language and jargon from the world that they critically hold against the light, sometimes by incorporating laws or habits or beliefs or uh, relics of that from those reviewed worlds into their poetry. For Christian Buck, one of the poets here tonight, a conceptual framework is essential. Is a Noah collection, for instance, contains only poems in which just a single vowel is allowed. Xenotext, his current project, is even more ambitious. For over 10 years, Book has been attempting a living poetry by implanting a coded poem into a living bacteria, which has an ultimate goal, the bacteria is going to write a poem back. I'm still waiting for the poem, but it will come in the end. In Book's work, science becomes poetry, and poetry, science. Nachum Weinberg, our second poet from the Netherlands, is undoubtedly one of the most prolific Dutch poets. Though he might have a reputation as a difficult poet, he disputes this. If you can read a newspaper article, you can read my poetry, is what he says. And although his poetry indeed is often simple in its language and accessible, Weinberg, who is also a professor of cultural entrepreneurship and management, often tackles large and complex themes. His monumental collection Van Groot Belang, for instance, references economic and political theories to address key issues in contemporary society. Each of Ida Buriel's much praised and awarded collection, our third poet from, of this evening, forms a cohesively and rigorously composed whole that is always rooted in extensive research and a strong thematic principle. Her collection, Maximum Kakeni, the Sabotage Manuals, appears to be both a practical handbook and a philosophical study of the various ways the language of power and authority can be sabotaged, a recurring theme in her poetry. Her best-known work, Ma, responds to Inger Kistensen's iconic alphabet and gives a po poetic voice to the malign conscience of the political world, with its streams of refugees, abuses of power, and environmental crisis. Please, may I ask? A warm applause for the three poets and ask the poets to come to the table. Um, I, I don't think you three know each other's work, or do you? Uh, only by reputation. Okay small part of it. And, um, but um, since you all three have a, a very personal and, and, and specific style, because you work according to 
uh, strong principles or uh, starting points. Um, do you have encountered other poets in the circles you are moving that are similar in their work as yours is? You, for instance, Christian, you accept being called a conceptual poet, and there are more conceptual poets. And do you feel that you're connected to them, do, that they do work in the same style, in the same approach, or with the same sort of results? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of conceptualism. I'm one of the four, three uh, people who originally founded uh, the poetic movement. If I were to die tomorrow, I think I would be famous 100 years from now, not for any of the poems I've written, but because I was involved in a foundational uh, 21st century poetry movement. Um, it includes uh, people like Kenneth Goldsmith, um, uh, Derek Beaulieu, uh, Craig Dworkin, among many others, Vanessa Place. There's numerous poets uh, whose concerns are primarily about the limit cases of uh, writing. Uh, we're very interested in those uh, kinds of poetry where uh, a person might look at it and say, that's not writing. If they, if they look at the work and say, that can't possibly be writing, we, we perk up at that moment. We look at that with much interest. Um, and at least in its founding moment, uh, in the late 90s, uh, we had four categories of writing that we thought constituted limit cases. Uh, among them would be uh, plagiarized writing, uh, the kind of work that my friend Kenneth Goldsmith uh, is now notorious for uh, yeah. championing. Yeah. Uh, the idea that uh, work might be poetic simply by virtue of its being recopied, and he was renowned for uh, simply uh, uh, appropriating uh, other people's work and publishing it under his own name. Um, the second uh, limit case that we examined was um, constraint-based forms of writing that are written according to Herculean sets of principles, uh, really difficult procedural rules, and that's probably the work for which I'm best known. Uh, but um, we have other peers uh, who uh, look at work that is illegible, deliberately designed not to be read. It's written in an alien language. It's uh, asemic because it's a visual poem. It's designed to be looked at, not understood. Um, and then finally, and probably the most uh, significant uh, limit case, would be work that's written entirely by machines on our behalf, uh, work that would be generated almost entirely by computerized uh, forms of uh, programming. In each one of these cases, these are uh, you know, works that would be dismissed as uncreative. Uh, we are interested in uncreative writing, uh, rather than creative writing, which is, of course, taught throughout uh, North America in universities and uh, MFA programs. Uh, we are curious about those kinds of works that would be dismissed as uncreative, that would be uh, uneventful, boring, strange, too difficult to imagine uh, uh, being interesting. And the irony, of course, is that uh, uh, when done well, you produce something that is, in fact, very engaging and, and uh, exciting, uh, if, if it's done well. well but I, it's, I think it's hard to say that your work is uncreative in a way that Kenneth Goldsmith means. But maybe I can, I can come back to that sure. uh, later. But, but uh, uh, Mahoum, to ask this, uh, well, this, this question uh, put to you, uh, do you consider yourself, um, let's say a poet with this, with this such a remarkable own style that there's no one to compare with or no one you can see as a, a colleague that is doing the same thing as you, as you are doing. Well, up to now, all the groups I tried to become a member of refused me. Oh yeah, you did apply for <laughs> a, a, certain, a certain group. I tried everything. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, so I, yeah, I, uh, it's by default, I'm afraid. Yeah. So you're, you're a poet of your own, you're your, you're your own group, or uh, at least you are, you have your own way of working, your own Well, approach. I mean, it's, 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 again, apart from that nobody wants me anyway, but I, 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 I don't actually consider myself so much of an isolated case, maybe even a limit case, mm. as you seem to suggest. I, no, I no, think I was just wondering if it, if it, that's what you feel or... No, no, uh, I feel myself completely in the center of what poetry has been for the last couple of thousand years. Yeah, yeah okay, that's, that, that's understandable, <laughs> yeah. And you, Ida, do you think that you, you find other colleagues working in your country or... or, or everywhere in the world as a poet that do the same things as you are doing or similar things in 
yeah, approach? Um, or? Yeah, I'm thinking I'm, I, I read other conceptual poets or semi-conceptual poets with, with pleasure and joy yeah. uh, when I find them. Um, but maybe what I'm looking for more actively is, is poetry that really disturbs me or yeah. that uh, wakes me up or you know, makes something happen that I wasn't expected. Um, I'm thinking that the perfect answer to, to the question, in a way, if you look at the hegemony of power today, of neoliberalism, then I would say that, no, I feel like a, a, a lone subject and no mm. one is like me and I'm totally atomized and, okay. and uh, yeah. I'm a genius and <laughs> no one can do anything similar to what I do. But if we rather have that you would say, <laughs> no, of course, yeah, it, of course, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. What, what are we writing as a collective, like yeah. all the poets are, that are, are now part writing? of a collective? In if a, it's in one big text, yeah, okay, you can you consider it. No, I, the, the thing is because I, I wanted to look for uh, an explanation for us as a, at the Poetry International Festival to bring you three together here mm -hmm. and suggest that there is a similarity in your work or your, in your approach. And I think there is, in a way, in dealing with language and dealing with certain subjects, because uh, um, you mentioned the uncreative, the uncreativeness of the group of conceptual poets that's, well, mm -hmm. and, and Kenny is, is, is a strong example of that. But um, you are working with your language. It's not just found language. It's not just simply wrote down in a, some sort of an instant of an emotional sort of working. It's, it's very conceived. In, and I think that's what Mahum is doing as well. It's very, um, he has a strong consciousness about the language in which he writes because your way of writing, your syntax, is, it's, it's, it's very well thought. And I think that's the same with you, Ida, isn't it? And does it mean that um, language as such is an important part of the way you deal with your subjects? Maybe to explain it a little bit more, you, of course, you have language, if you start writing as a poet, it starts with language, usually. Maybe it starts with an idea. It could be that there's a difference between three of you. But you start writing, and language, uh, that's what I heard from a lot of poets, language takes over. Mm -hmm. It's language that is sure. directing you in a certain direction, and a certain, maybe a certain subject, or a cer certain content of the poet, poems. Do you... Well, uh, my, gang, that. my gang of uh, poets uh, uh, called into question, I think, the value of expression as the uh, standard of judgment by which mm. we would evaluate a work of writing, that, that uh, poetry is not primarily expressive in its, in its gestures, although, I mean, it can do those things. Uh, we were curious about forms of writing that were more generative rather than expressive. Like, you, you, you do something in poetry because uh, you want to find out what happens by doing it. It's an experiment. Uh, I mean, I don't write about my personal experience. I never write about my own uh, attitudes emotionally towards the world, in part because I'm a very boring person, I have to say. I'm not an astronaut. I'm not a mountain climber. I'm not a, somebody who's lived a life of adventure and, and wonderment. Um, but I, I, we're all curious about the, the uh, effect that language might have uh, when, when forced into um, uh, uh, tasks that are not designed to be meaningful. I mean, the, 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 when, you, when you recruit language to do something that it wasn't intended to do. Uh, I mean, language is a very alien, strange thing that we barely understand it, I think. And the poet's job is to kind of reverse engineer this alien technology in order to make something uh, uh, amazing from it, right? And we design anti-grav machines out of words, right? You know, in Area 51. Uh, so that, uh, you know, the world might uh, understand what language can do, you know, when it's somehow freed from the need to mean things. I mean, in some sense, I think that's what poetry does. It kind of puts a language uh, uh, in, on vacation uh, from the necessity to mean something uh, to, in order just to explore what it can do uh, when freed from that necessity. But, but mm. given the, your, your latest project, the Xeno text, in, in, in which you are trying to write something that, that goes into this bacteria and, and there's a poem coming out in the end, mm -hmm. probably, yep. that it makes it a very conscious deed of writing and you have to think about what language you're using and how do you code or decode the language into the result you're aiming at. 
Uh, yeah, this project is a, 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 a long-term ongoing uh, work in which I write a very short poem and then through a process of encipherment, I translate it into a genetic sequence and then implant it into a bacterium, replacing part of its genetic code with my poem. Mm -hmm. So the organism now becomes the living embodiment of my text. But I've written the poem in such a way that the organism can actually understand that gene sequence and respond to it. It'll actually do something in answer to it. And in this case, it actually builds a protein in response to those genetic instructions, uh, a protein whose sequence of molecules uh, enciphers yet another poem, a completely different poem. Uh, now, I've actually managed to get this project to work uh, in a colony of E. coli. I've managed to demonstrate that it's possible to do something like this. Uh, the first poet in human history to do something as crazy as this. Uh, but it's not the intended outcome. Uh, ideally, I would like to be able to get the thing to work properly in an unkillable organism that's capable of surviving in all kinds of hostile environments. Uh, there's a, there's a, a bacterium that's capable of, of uh, surviving in the open vacuum of outer space. You, know, you can scorch it, freeze it, wither it, it won't die. You can blast it with radiation, it won't die. It uh, is resistant to evolutionary drift, it doesn't mutate or evolve. It's uh, so well adapted to the lethality of the universe that it doesn't need to change. And by putting it, sound, my, it sounds as the outcome of everything. Yeah, well, I, I look at this as a, as a kind of... A super... A, it, super it, it's, it's a little god. It's a, it's a strange, you know, kind of old organism, like a dragon, you know, deep in the uh, evolutionary history of the planet. We don't know where it came from or why it exists. But by putting my poem into this organism, I'd be effectively writing a book that might outlast terrestrial civilization. And it could be on the planet Earth when the sun explodes. So I'm trying to write a book that lasts forever. And that's the concept. Like, what, in, among my peers, what we strive to do is produce something that is a really good idea. Right? The, the, that I, I, can sum, I can sum it up in a, in, a, in a single sentence, and you go, boy, that would be a really amazing book. That would be an impossible achievement. And you, then you don't need to realize it. The idea is good enough. Just the concept of the work itself is, uh, is sufficient, yeah. But, if I may interrupt mm. you. But uh, um, you, the three of you, you're, you're, you're very aware of all kinds of uh, things happening in society and, and social issues. And uh, do you have any idea that your work has, can be of any value of changing things or getting people on other thoughts or changing something in society? Of course, that's, that's quite a... a some some ideal if you could do that as a poet, but uh, probably you can't. But it it I think you can I can imagine that if you choose this sort of subjects that you want to have an effect of writing about it. If I could just you know take a little leap back. Yeah, of course. I, I would say that in relation to what you were saying, I would uh, my line of work is a little bit different. Um, I would say that uh, as a poet, I've I'm able to stick with it. To, to get the idea, but sticking with it, and there's the difference. I can investi uh, investigate uh, the language of law and bureaucracy in one of my books, and I can do that for three years. I can uh, sit and listen to this local radio station with racist, lonely, elderly people for hours and weeks. Uh, in, um, also in a John Cage sort of a way, to mm -hmm. see, well, what happens? If you listen for five minutes and you have a laugh, what happens if you listen to it for two hours and after two weeks, <laughs> then what happens? Yeah. And the same thing if you start looking at finance and economy, what happens if you read annual reports mm. for one minute and then you fall asleep? <laughs> but okay. when you wake up, you read 200 more. And, and it, that way of discovering or seeing yeah. how you are affected in your language or trying and, to yeah. force some poetry out of that, maybe. And is, the, is this a conscious way of, uh, of, of using this text afterwards? And you have listened to it or you read uh, stuff yeah, for about poetry, two weeks and, then, yeah. oh, and right. then, you, yeah, then you start writing with this text in mind? Or? I, I would say that writing becomes a way of making it bearable. Mm to be able to read for yourself because it's so boring yeah. or it's yeah. so violent or it's so strange or it's just such gray material yeah. that you feel like uh, this is not i will not i will just you know but there, there is a me. reason why you're why you're doing your best to get into this boring material yes to investigate it to investigate and to see it. what is there and to just to see you know what can be shown about it and mm. in which way can i portray it but not just copying it. No. 
you know, just not just putting it in the frame of a book and looking say, for what is what 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 the text actually does and what it means for people who yeah, are working what, with it. Yeah, text, or what so happens yeah. to you when you read yeah. it for that long or yeah. spend that much time with it. And it maybe is it the same with you, Nachum, because you're writing on, on economics as well and on finances and the market and. Um, is it something that's, that, that starts in the same way as, as Ida is, is telling about, reading the, the, the serious stuff about this and then, well, contemplating or reflecting on it and start writing poetry about it? Or how do you work in this well, sense? I, 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 okay, firstly, I agree much more, I think, with Ida as far as it's... I mean, one of the interesting things I actually try to understand a little bit better is how poems are at the same time like theories and experiments. Uh, and this, this gives them a kind of a quaint status in, uh, in, uh, as a scientific discipline. But I, I rather I rather think that meaning is quite important. And, and, and the other thing is I don't like a real captive audience so I never would feed a bacterium a poem of mine. But the, uh, uh, and I think, I mean, of course I, I write among other things about issues in economics, but I, I certainly don't read a couple of hundred uh, yearly reports to... I actually, when I write poetry which has to do with economics, I try to communicate with, well, whoever has some interesting ideas in economics uh, and, well, they are usually have something to do with empirical reality, but mm -hmm. it's not, that's not the starting point. I don't go out and, and look at... Uh, at money being printed to write about money supply, although it would be even more boring than reading yearly reports. I'm not completely uh, sure I may... No, no, yeah, I can, I can imagine, but yeah, of course, Just, if you want. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would like to add, because you, you talk about meaning, and, and, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, poetry making sense, but then I would, would add to it, you know, the, the using all of our senses. And that being sort of a challenge of poetry. For instance, in, in, in discussing and, and talking about finance and uh, economics, how do you put the senses into that, you know, the, the, since we're humans and not, not machines? That's what interests me about making sense. Well, I mean, but there I, I really think that language, to, to, to almost wrap up this, this, this point, to, uh, language has a privileged status when it concerns meaning. So I'm, I'm very, yes, I, we perceive the world in all kinds of, of strange ways through whatever senses we have available, but to make sense of it, if you do it through poetry, because you can make sense of it by baking a cake. Yeah. Uh, can be made sensible by. By the way, yeah, my cakes yeah, are even yeah. worse than my poetry, so it's not something I would mm -hmm. go. But if you, I mean, I still think, and this is at uh, at the risk of sounding slightly antagonistic, but most things which are, I mean, called conceptual poetry, I, I mean. It's a little bit, I'm, I'm really worried about the history of visual art. I mean, visual art completely went wrong. Uh, that that, that, that uh, poetry, yeah. poetry is in danger sometimes of following this, and that would be a pity. And because, I mean, the, the idea is a bit, or maybe I'm putting words in other people's mouths, which I shouldn't do, just as one shouldn't put poetry in bacteria. I mean, I know you, you did it with the best intentions, but it feels vaguely unethical. I mean, it, uh, uh, I'm very much in favor of experiments on human beings, but on bacteria. Uh, it's, they can't uh, defend themselves, you mean? No, yeah. yes. I mean, they cannot even write a poem back to complain. Well, well the, your well, poem, I mean, they course, can. Of course, Christian is trying to, <laughs> to learn it to write back. But, yeah. but just to get back to the, to the slightly more serious point, I mean, I don't... Some of these experiments seem to 
like result from an idea that, lang that, that, that language, written language, is in a way, I mean, it doesn't do enough. It's mm. like exhausted to some extent. We need to, we need to, 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 to enlarge the experience. And actually, I don't understand much yet of anything which has to do with written language. It's like the, mm -hmm. the smallest, tiniest piece of something which, at least to me, is so much bigger that I'm, I'm really worried of, of of neglecting this, which precisely has to do with the silly power of language to to make sense of the little bits one can make. But if sense it's of. if it's so hard to, to to get a good knowledge of what, what language is or what it does and the importance of it, is is poetry a solution to that? Is poetry a, a way of getting a deeper understanding of language? Well, in. <laughs> In a very utilitarian way, yes, because I mean, to write vaguely decent poetry, you need to 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 have. I mean, again, it's a, it, to to get some sense of what is possible to do with language, because before you know it, you're doing something terribly wrong with the language. So just to keep the language in check, you have to understand a little bit of what the language is doing. And, and if you're talking about doing wrong with language, are you, are you, are you then referring to, to framing it in a certain way? Because uh, what I see, in, for instance, also in the work of, uh, of Ida, that, that she is uh, researching how language is used, how language was used, how language is used to frame a certain view on society. And um, the idea about uh, your sabotage manual, I think, is also to, to look at what, what language is doing and how it can be used for deviation or to sabotage things, to twist something in a direction that will alter reality or social reality. Yeah, I, um, I guess uh, it also asks the question of um, of the factory. Mm -hmm. So if we're not, if some of us would have worked in factories back in the days, and today the factory doesn't look like that anymore, like this brick building where we go between, I don't know, if we work 10 hours shifts or 16. Anyhow, what is the factory today? Uh, because you, in order to, to know how to commit an act of sabotage, you would have to define the factory. Yeah? And even one would, could think that if the subject is the factory mm -hmm. that is most wanted today, so how do you work as, as a factory on your own? And in that case, what is self-sabotage? I know there are a lot of handbooks and... Uh, personality tests of how you're sabotaging yourself by eating a pizza, but I'm not talking about if, <laughs> that level. If you consider yourself <laughs> as a factory, maybe then that's... Well, what would the sabotage yeah. be, you know? Yeah, um, um, yeah what was the question? But that, well, actually, you're, well, it, it's about making, uh, making sense and, uh, in, in language or trying to work with language, because um, Nahum was telling about it's such, it's such an unknown territory in a way, and a language has such an enormous influence in how we perceive things and how we get to know the world. And uh, I was wondering what, what, for getting, knowing the world, is poetry something that, that is very uh, accurate or at least is something to, to practice in order to get via language a better understanding of what is happening around, of, of who we are or uh, how, how society looks like. And, and that uh, compared with the fact that we can encounter a lot of um, framed language in political sense, in society, in the way we are, uh, for instance, also in, in science, for instance. It's also a sort of a framed language, I, I suppose, a language that is used in a certain sense. Well, po poets don't uh, really address uh, the world of science very adequately, especially in the 21st century. Um, I mean, poetry used to found civilizations. Uh, it doesn't do that now. Uh, and I, one of the inadequacies of poetry, the one thing that really surprises me about it, is that um, 50 years ago, uh, human beings walked on the moon. 
And that's my very first memory that I can actually date. I was a child when that happened, and uh, I was maybe just a little less than three years old. And uh, from my perspective, that event is probably the greatest uh, uh, achievement of any living thing that's ever appeared upon this planet. That's the most important thing that's ever happened uh, in the history of evolution, uh, that uh, a species actually deliberately set foot on an extraterrestrial world. Uh, that's uh, tantamount to being alive at the moment when a lungfish hops from one tide pool and crosses the land to another tide pool. That's a very important emotion, uh, evolutionary moment in the mm -hmm. history of uh, our species. And yet, if I were to ask you, what's your favorite canonical poem about the moon landing? You won't have it. There is no such poem. Uh, yet, if the ancient Greeks had wrote a trireme to the moon, you can bet there would be a 12-volume epic poem that we would uh, uh, be reading a thousand years, Homer. right? There yeah. would be a 21st century yeah. Homer. There is no yeah. 21st century Homer that's responding to that important event, which is probably the most important event in the history of anything on this planet putting a, you know, a footprint on another world. And it's important in what sense? Because you could say it as a, as a technical development and strong... Uh, I, I'm actually talking about an evolutionary history. Like I'm talking about the evolution of life, being able to exit this gravity well and go to another world. That's tantamount, as I said, to a lungfish hopping out of the ocean and crossing the land, like becoming a terrestrial uh, organism. It's, it's a, an important moment when we you know, uh, 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 enter into the cosmos, right? We're actually now a sentient species, mm. a super civilization about ready, on the verge of entering into a kind of cosmic moment as a species. And yet there's no poetry about that. And this strikes me as a terrible inadequacy uh, in the history of poetry. Uh, for example, you know, the, you know, the claim that my work might be unethical by virtue of the fact I'm trying to implant it into a bacterium doesn't take into account that we actually have no way of preserving our cultural heritage against planetary disasters that would wipe us out. We have no way of ensuring that uh, our culture could be reconstructed. And that, to me, is the ethical conundrum that uh, my work you know, uh, 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 invites. It's a point of saying, look, we have no way of ensuring that our cultural heritage will outlast us. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're the most important thing that cosmos has ever made. Right? The, we're the means by which the universe freaks itself out. Right? Okay. We're the means yeah. by which it knows itself. And yet, if you know, a, a single asteroid impact, a nuclear war would wipe it all out. Like you know, millions of years of evolutionary uh, history. But would it? Would it? Would it? Hey, well, actually, you can ask yourself: Would it be a pity if if we are wiped out and everything? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it would it has be. Been wiped out. I, I think it would be a pity. The, the, the people who purport to think that it wouldn't be, right, who pretend cynically that uh, it would be better if, the, if we didn't exist, are are treacherous. I look at, I look at that as as utterly cynical. You know, I, I, like yeah. to me, to me, the, the 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 role that poetry plays within our own cultural heritage is akin to founding a civilization. It's a means by which we preserve our cultural history over thousands of years. I mean, your oldest stories are poetic, right? Mm. All of the religions are founded on books that are poetic. But, right? but there is also, of course, a long history and line of poems that were never written, that should have been written, or were burnt in the same, very same history from uh, ancient I, I, I agree, it's just that I'm looking at this as an enormous inadequacy. Poetry is inadequate to our world right now. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to respond you know, to the socio-technological circumstances of a 21st century experience. That's why I'm interested in trying to genetically engineer a poem. Right? Uh, to me, it's important to be able to uh, uh, entertain or discuss, you know, our potential extinction as a species. And that would be a terrible thing to happen. It would be a horrible, a horrible tragedy. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm broaching it. I'm broaching it from, you know, a, a conceptual perspective. It's like a, <laughs> right? we, we entertain that idea as an artistic idea, right? We, we think about all kinds of terrible outcomes and tragic outcomes as, a, as simulating, you know, simulations of... But hasn't different. this, this saying this, hasn't it some sort of a connection with what Nahum was saying earlier, that um, we, are, we are using language, and language is very important, language helps us to understand things. Also, the concept of what you are referring to, of the extinction of uh, of our planet or the human mm -hmm. species and get the, the l losing our cultural heritage, in a way, saying this and uh, reflecting on that is also a language thing, isn't it? Uh, I mean, uh, I would I would say yes, that's true uh, uh, to a point. I'm I, to me the more provocative idea, if you're a poet, is to imagine that language uses us as the means of its own reproduction. Right? You know that that we are. 
in exchange for granting us uh, sentience, you know, we become the means by which language uh, propagates itself. Right? I mean, we're the kind of viral, you know, uh, uh, transmitters of, of language and cultural heritage through time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, he, that it, it uses us and it may not have our interests at heart, right? I mean, it tends to colonize every surface, every mm -hmm. corner of, uh, of intellectual life, right? I mean, language is everywhere around you. You cannot leave this building and uh, ignore it. It is written across uh, the world like lichen, like algae on a rock. Like it's it, it's got a life of its own. It's in some sense the poet is is wrestling with something that's way bigger than themselves. I mean, language is something that is a truly super organism. Mm. It's 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 strange. It's alien. We don't fully understand its role in our thinking. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's is an that unusual some, thing. Is that something that's maybe it's the same sort of fear, well, if I may call it fear, as Nahum was expressing, if you were talking about language and... <laughs> I think that, that, that he yeah. and I have the same kind of quandaries of, or fear of language, like the, the language has some sort of inimical role to play in our lives, right? You know, there's yeah. something slightly apocalyptic about it. Yeah. Can I'm thinking you, about yeah. this, this uh, uh, essay by uh, Muriel Lurkaiser. I think she wrote it in 49. It's called The, F the Fear of Poetry. And uh, in it, she talks about how we at school and in society uh, are trying to use every little bit of knowledge that we have and can find within science and so forth in order to, you know, to um, explore the world and to grow as human beings and society. All kinds of knowledge, um, except one, and that one kind of knowledge being poetry. And she connects that with the fear of poetry. So that is sort of a banned knowledge. Okay. Yeah. And I think that still might be a valid comment. What kind of a knowledge might poetry be? On? Okay. And who is asking for it? And who is saying that it's just difficult or boring or too complicated or complicated on purpose? And, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe that's, this is a good point on listening to some poets. Sure. The both of you, and read a poetry. Poem. Sure. Would you, would you be so kind to read these, these two? One is from Sino text, while the other one is from Inoya? Sure, I'll read uh, an excerpt from what I think is my best poem I've ever written. Uh, this is uh, uh, from The Perfect Malware, uh, uh, the project that I'm currently working on. Must we bequeath to the darkness all the bright tokens of what we know? Must we greet each revenant in hell with goodwill, speaking whatever language can cast a spell upon such a ghost? Must a Nazi file from the Wehrmacht be the Virgil who salutes these shadows on our behalf? Must we retell the legend of our ascent from the yowling of the rainforest to the roaring of the spacecraft? Must we flip through the scrapbook, reminiscing over Polaroids of our excursion from the ovum to the void? Must we tour the ruin that the whale songs lament? Let us betray our sorrow through the play of syrinxes and dulcimers, of gamelons and violotas. Let us give away the brainwaves of a woman who dreams fondly of her lovers. Let the death of verse be dated by the half-life of uranium-238, electro plated on a disc of gilded copper. Let us discover virales in the midst of alien fires. Now this uh, next excerpt is uh, from the book for which I'm probably best known, Unoya. This is from chapter E for Rene Crevel. And fettered these sentences repress free speech. The text deletes selected letters. We see the revered exegete reject metered verse. The sestet, the tercet, even les saints allevés en grec. 
He rebels. He sets new precedents. He lets cleverness exceed decent levels. He eschews the esteemed genres, the expected themes, even les belles lettres en verre. He prefers the perverse French esthetes, Verne, Pierret, Junet, Pierrec. Hence, he pens fervent screeds, then enters the street where he sells these letterpress newsletters, three cents per sheet. He engenders perfect newness wherever we need fresh terms. Now, I might like to note uh, that these works were uh, uh, gratefully translated uh, by uh, Han Van de Verlech, uh, who's uh, here in the audience. I really am very grateful for the uh, brilliance of his translations. Thank you very kindly for being so gracious. Okay, thank you. Thank you. These are excerpts of poetry, and we have another reflection on poetry. If you, if you like to go to the lecture, if you, if you like, you can sit down if you like, but whatever right, you like. Let's make it conceptual. Let's make it conceptual. Yeah. <laughs> At, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I always feel a bit silly, well, sillier than usual reading poetry while sitting. Uh, oh gosh, I need, to, I need to read in Dutch. Uh, sorry. Als je wil weten waar poëzie goed voor is, moet je die vraag ook toestaan. Dichters schrijven minder dan de dag lang is, ook als ze zoveel schrijven als jij, omdat ze zo bang zijn dat ze een heel leger om zich heen willen hebben voordat ze een bevel durven op te schrijven. En nog minder wanneer ze zich herinneren, omdat het avond wordt, hoe ze alles kwijtraakten, behalve die paar woorden waar ze maar een klein deel van begrepen. In het leger van dichters wacht je, net als de anderen, op bevelen van wie het hele leger is en hoe had je het opgesteld willen hebben. Je schrijft gedichten om vertaald te worden, want die taal van jou is die van vertalingen en een vertaler, elke vertaler, mag gedichten openbreken, samenvoegen, zoals Fitzgerald met Omar. Als de vertaler denkt dat hij je goed genoeg kent om een steentje in een beker te laten vallen omdat het ochtend wordt. Mijn heren, het is tijd voor het ochtendgebed, wat betekent voor de opstand. Wanneer zou poëzie nergens meer voor nodig zijn? Poëzie doet niet veel, maar vergeleken met wat? Poëzie laat de doden niet opstaan, weer gaan liggen, weer opstaan, maar soms laat het opstaan opstaan. Weet je al een manier om door te gaan gedichten te schrijven als je je minder goed kan herinneren wat je gisteren gelezen hebt en je liet opstaan voordat je merkte dat je dat deed? Hoe je je voorstelt dat ze lezen wat je geschreven hebt in een sporthal waar ze haastig tafels en klapstoelen neergezet hebben, niet als voor een examen, maar als voor een huwelijksmarkt voor wie één arm mist of één been of één oog. En iedereen leest hardop, behalve één die stil leest. Wie binnenkomt, begint waar hij wil en leest zo snel als hij wil. Geen twee zijn op dezelfde pagina. Zoals waar je heen gaat voor het ochtendgebed. Enkel omdat je een rouwgebed wilde zeggen, waarvoor het nodig is dat anderen om je heen staan. Maar niet dat ze even ver weg zijn of zelf aan een ochtendgebed begonnen zijn. Vroeg in de ochtend in een vergaderzaal, hoog in een kantoorgebouw, midden in de stad. Waar moet je verder van weten om poëzie te schrijven? Hoogstens zoveel als het zout dat je tussen je duim en wijsvinger houdt, of het zout dat al in je eten is en de kok hoeft niet boven zijn pannen te huilen. Wat al in ontroering is of in medelijden of in dat niet alles tegelijk weggaat, maar je wilde dat als je iets zegt, omdat je iets weet, het poëzie is en niets anders. De gedichten die anderen hebben laten liggen toen ze je naar voren schreeuwden. Toen je ze naar voren schreeuwden. Het is al genoeg als je die op kan rapen en iets uit het gedicht kan oplezen om een van hen weer op weg te sturen. Nu in een andere richting, zoals een verkenner die bang teruggekomen is. Of dat iets van een gedicht van een van hen in je hoofd naklinkt als je iets gaat zeggen wat erop lijkt. En als het niet genoeg is, erop lijkt samen met iets uit een gedicht van nog een ander. En iets uit een gedicht van nog een ander die net nog vertaald werd voordat niemand zijn taal meer sprak. Van drie maak je één als het met twee niet lukt. Of van een groter aantal terugtellend zo ver als je kan en je weet dat het verder gaat. Je verkenners, de voorhoede, deel van je leger waarover je nu nog denkt. Dat je helemaal aan het einde zonder kan. De dichters van vroeger, van verder weg en die er niet lang geleden nog waren. Of misschien zijn ze er nog. Je stelt ze op als aantekeningen 
ver links en ver rechts op het papier. Maar wat doe je als wat ze laten liggen te vroeg vertelt wat zij en jij van plan kunnen zijn? Je kan toch niet achter elk van hen aanlopen en opruimen? Maar je kan ze zo snel naar voren sturen dat niets van jullie van wat jullie van plan konden zijn, nog precies zoals het opgeschreven is, uitgevoerd kan worden. En dat moet genoeg zijn. Je bent toch zo'n dichter voor wie een paar doden meer of minder aan jouw kant niet veel uitmaken. Dank u. These were, these were examples and, and your text is referring to what poetry could be. And, and we, we heard some examples of poetry written by, uh, by um, uh, Christian. Um, this, this last poem you, you, you read, was it, is it, you have given yourself thoughts about what, what the importance of poetry is, how you, have, how you can use it, how you can do it. Is this some sort of a recipe for yourself or is it a recipe for other poets or some, something other poets should take in consideration? Not so much as a recipe, although there is a crying cook in the poem. Uh, which, there are lots of crying cooks in my poems lately. Uh, it's, no, it, it, it's really part of, an, of trying to find out a little bit better, as little as it is, what poetry can do for, not so much for others as for myself, because I'm a very egotistical person, uh, but at the same time, I mean, what poetry can do is also what poetry can do for me, so in that sense, I happily, I try to understand also what I can do with other people's work in a way which, which, uh, which is a really old style, modernistic, and in the best tradition of modern science. We, and in this sense, we completely agree because one of the things I also try to protest, not just visual art, but also anything which smacks of postmodern science and neglecting the enormous performances of modern science in the last couple of centuries, partly by really working together, not in the, in the silly way of, uh, of, uh, of being nice to each other, but actually in trying to, to see each other as part of, 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 of yeah, armies, yeah. Any, yeah. everybody of us sings they command. Okay, that's, 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 that is referring also to, to cooperation, to be aware of others and do things together. Yes, I'm yeah, not. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a nice that's bridge, a point. I think. Yeah, because we will hear a reading of Ida Bariel's Mixum Kakani, the sabotage manuals. You cut at the shop, we cut at the pay, I crocodile, I crocodiled, and I will crocodile. The big, little, Rotterdam sabotage event. Taken in the Dutch, 
1400s when impoverished workers through their clogs far into the future as they had lost hope for a better life for their children or since they had just begun to hope for one. No longer would oppressed people be sure that history was on their side. No longer could they therefore be satisfied with creating <coughs> improvements in the belief that these would see fruition in the lives of their children and grandchildren. No longer could they be persuaded to postpone, present complaints in the name of a beneficent future. In short, the multiple producers of the capitalist world economy had lost the main, hidden stabilizer of the system, the optimism of the oppressed, Emmanuel Wallerstein. The word is taken from the act, from the verb sabote, stop with pause, slap together, neglect, a saboteur is someone who drags their feet. The word is taken from the late 1800s. The French slang, sabot, someone with their head in the clouds, all thumbs and shitty shoes. So, saboteur doesn't really rhyme with amateur. Simultaneously in Moscow. Who decides? Wash your hands. Home is the body's best friend. You can't find good asphalt on the street. Onward to a dark path. I crocodile. I crocodile. And I will crocodile. Wash your hands. Bone is the body's best friend. You can't find good asphalt on the street. Onward to a dark past. I crocodile. I crocodile. And I will crocodile. I carnival this town. So what? Who decides? Wash your hands. The bone is the body's best friend. You can't find good asphalt on the street. Onward to a dark past. I crocodile. I crocodile. And I will crocodile. I carnival. Thank you. 
It's over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you well. Um, <clears throat> it was an experiment. I hope you enjoyed it, or at least was intrigued by how it went. And um, I can imagine that you could use a drink. We all can. So let's go to the bar. I see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>